Welcome to Publication Ethics Part 4. We're going to be discussing conflicts of interest. My name is Dr. Sharon Pearson. I'm on the faculty of the University of Texas, El Paso, and I'm also the editor-in-chief of the Journal of the American Academy of Nurse Practitioners and nurse author and editor. This is the fourth part of a five-part series on publication ethics. And our objectives for this discussion are to talk about conflict of interest or competing interests relating to writing, reviewing, and conducting research. And you should be able to describe at least one resource for proper disclosure of competing interests, which I'll tell you about. And also to develop a personal strategy to avoid conflicts of interest. So let's start uh, first with definitions of conflict of interest. This comes from the ICMJE uh, document, the uh, Uniform Requirements for the Submission of Manuscripts. There's a very good discussion of conflicts of interest in this, and the definition that they actually, uh, and I'm going to read this because I think it's really important, um, it's very broad. Conflict of interest exists when an author or the author's institution, reviewer or editor has financial or personal relationships that inappropriately influence or bias his or her actions. Such relationships are also known as dual commitments, competing interests, or competing loyalties. And these conflicts of interest can be financial, academic, um, they can be just an intellectual passion. There are some people who will not consider publishing articles that discuss a certain topic because they don't believe that uh, that, that's, uh, that, that topic is, is uh, true. Um, and the other important thing to remember is that it's important to understand that it's the potential for conflict of interest or the possible appearance of conflict of interest, not necessarily that we are accusing you as authors or reviewers of conflicts of interest. But um, we really need to understand and hear from you what any of these potentials might, might be. So conflicts of interest apply to everyone involved in conducting research. Um, there is a disclosure form. Uh, at the ICMJE website under the uniform requirements and it's a it's a PDF file you can fill it in and send it in your along with your submission to the um, to the journal as if you think that there is any potential conflict that the editor should know about now for the most part we all know that we get things from drug companies uh, logo things like a coffee mug or a pen um, and it might not necessarily cause a conflict of interest, but sometimes there's large money at stake. Um, for example, a very large um, funded clinical trial for a new drug, testing a new drug or comparing one drug to another drug. And if the, if the, the interest, the financial interest is not declared, then a reader looking at that report of that research might say, oh, but the company paid for this research, so how good could it be? So all of that really has to be um, disclosed. So let me just give you a couple of instances where this has happened to me. Um, we, had a, uh, we have a guideline that says this is what you should say if there are no conflicts of interest. And um, the authors submitted this conflict of interest statement, which was basically taken verbatim from our website, our author guidelines, stating that they had no guideline, that they had no conflicts. When the article published, the authors contacted me saying, oh, that was not the correct statement, that we had put in the wrong statement. And actually, they had sent the wrong statement. And what they had done was just cut and pasted from another um, article that they had written, and um, they did not disclose that there was um, there was a potential conflict of interest because the authors had been on speakers bureaus for a couple of the companies where the drugs were named, but this was not really um, a clinical trial or anything like that. So all we did was publish an erratum, uh, replacing the old 
disclosure statement with the new disclosure statement so that readers could make a, a decision for themselves. So um, the disclosure was not sufficient to retract the article, um, but I'm going to talk in the final section on retracted literature about some, sometimes when re retractions do occur that it is because of conflicts of interest. So here's another situation you might be involved in as a reviewer. I hope many of you are reviewing for the journals that you read. Um, we rely on reviewers to, to uh, help us make these decisions as to what's an appropriate manuscript to publish. But a reviewer was sent a request to review a manuscript um, and she replied that she was in the process of writing herself an article on the same topic or a closely related topic. And she was concerned this might be a conflict of interest. So the question is, is that really a conflict of interest? Well, I wouldn't be able to know as the editor whether uh, the fact that she was writing the same kind of article or similar article would influence her decision as to whether this other article was good or bad. So I thanked her and said um, it could be a potential conflict of interest and I thanked her for disclosing that to me and that was the appropriate thing for her to do and I assigned another reviewer to the article. So there are um, situations when just disclosing, having a frank discussion uh, is all that's needed. There, it's, there's, no, there's nothing punitive. Um, there, is no, uh, th there is no shame in disclosing that. In fact, it's a very um, honorable thing to do, to disclose competing interests. So here's another one, a hypothetical case. Um, and this actually comes from the ICMJE, um, and it's another quote. <coughs> Editors have potential conflicts of interest also. Um, for a long time, it was very difficult to get negative or uh, non-significant results published in a journal. And the reason for that is that editors want, uh, think that they will not attract readers if the findings of a study basically showed that nothing happened. It wasn't worth it. The intervention wasn't good. Um, the intervention made no difference. The standard treatment was, was uh, comparable to the intervention. And um, a second reason really is that <clears throat> um, many times when, uh, when the results are non-significant or negative, the authors find themselves really not knowing how to write an interesting paper about why it was still important to do that study. And if authors can, can do that, um, then editors are willing to publish negative or non-significant results. But it becomes a, a bigger challenge to write a manuscript for something that had negative or non-significant um, results. And Uh, actually, I want to, before I summarize this, I had just found this today, which I thought was fascinating. There's a blog called Retraction Watch, and you'll see uh, some of the examples of that in the next section on retraction. But um, there's a big case brewing in, um, in one of the journals, uh, an OBGYN journal, about pregnancy testing. And <clears throat> the, apparently the author did not disclose that he had received funding from a company that manufactures a home pregnancy test. And he wrote an article that was, um, that, that seemed to be biased towards that, that, that home pregnancy test. Um, another lawyer for another home pregnancy test company wrote to the editor of the journal saying he was gonna sue on behalf of his clients, who was gonna sue the publisher and the journal because uh, the article was hampering his client's ability to make, uh, to, to make money. So there's a lot of issues involved here. There's big money. Imagine this is pregnancy testing, home pregnancy testing. How many millions of women are doing home pregnancy testing? Uh, and there's a, and those tests are not cheap. 
So there's a lot of money involved, and whenever there's a lot of money involved, and there are potential conflicts of interest, um, that, that creates uh, a lot of uproar. So there are many interesting cases that appear on Retraction Watch, and um, if you're interested in that, uh, on the next series, there, are, there is the website that shows you how to get to that. But I just want to summarize again. Um, remember, it's the appearance of the potential conflict that matters. It's not, we're not uh, assigning blame, saying one person has a conflict, one does not. Just be honest in declaring your potential uh, conflicts and then use the ICMGE disclosure form as a guide. And um, just many of the scandals in bioscience today, as illustrated by that latest case in Retraction Watch, have resulted from undeclared competing interests. That probably would not have happened with that case that I just discussed if the author had made a complete disclosure at the time of submission of the manuscript. So a word to the wise, be completely open and transparent in your disclosures. Make sure that your disclosures are properly printed in the, in the journal when you submit, when your article is published.